Hey, 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 happy Monday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Gaming Gang Dispatch is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host, here at the Gaming Gang Dispatch, brought to you by, amazingly enough, thegaminggang.com, of which I happen to be the founder and chief editor-in-chief. What am I cracking up already? It's like... Damn, I swear, you know, the the temperatures cooled off and the spiders disappeared down here in the kingdom of spiders. And then it's colder than you know what out there today. And it's like suddenly they're all back. Weird. Anyway, I happen to be the founder and editor in chief of thegaminggang.com. So welcome back to the Duct Tape Studios, everybody. Going to have some fun tonight because tonight is Monday, October 17th, 2022. This is live stream number 839. If this is your first time joining me, let me point out, super, super casual around here. Just hanging out, talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news and taking a look at tabletop games. Every once in a while, I'll do a review of them live as well, which I was doing all week long last week. Changing things up a little bit this week. We'll talk about that in just a bit. But tonight, I am going to be taking a first look at the Shiver role-playing game yes it is a horror role-playing game which fits right into our current halloween season so this is from parable games we're going to be diving in in just a bit do want to mention if you're not overly familiar with the stream we do tackle the tabletop gaming news first so it'll be about 30 35 minutes before we dive on into the first look at shiver of course, do want to also mention when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you will not find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Also, this is live stream, so that means there is chat available. It's not on screen. One of the ways that I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay i also do that by requiring you to be a subscriber to the channel and to be a subscriber for at least 48 hours before taking part in chat so i got a couple of little fail safes in there so first out the gate tonight was the motor city madman that's right the madman is with us one of our chat moderators coco b is uh, sharing spooky greetings to everyone. Christopher Rush is with us. Mr. Eddie T, another of our chat moderators. Kathy Evans is uh, hanging out as well. So chat is off and running. So before I jump into the news, do you want to mention that the 50-50 game sale to benefit Extra Life did kick off this weekend, this past weekend, as I promised it would so there are over 200 items that are up for sale and one half of all proceeds raised minus the fee that paypal charges is going to be donated to extra life for kids i'm still not positive what's going on with the game day I don't think I can get the gang together to do a live stream. 
but I might do one solo. So we'll, we'll look into that. And it's not going to be any like 24 hours or 12 hours. We usually do a 12 hour game marathon, but maybe I would do six. So we shall see. We shall find out. So I do have a few folks who have already taken part in the sale. Christopher Rush is one of them. Thank you very much. I know Coco B just recently sent me an email, which I will respond to after the show. So Madman says, uh, FYI, they were still having an issue with October 1st and October 3rd old time radio shows. Hmm. You know, and I, I had gone back and I had changed those uh, in case you're wondering what the madman's chatting about there. It is the Gaming Gang October Spooktacular 2022. Every night I host a spooky old time radio show. And I thought it it's, you know, it's what I do is I actually upload the audio, the MP3, to archive.org, and then it provides a link. And then I just copy and paste that link into a post on thegaminggang.com. Easy peasy. Some strange reason there's a problem with the links that are coming from October 1st and October 3rd. So I don't know. I will double check those uh, once again. One thing I should also point out is you may need to clear your cache. So I don't know. William Hell is Eyes is uh, with us. Another person who is taking part in the 50-50 game sale says they were having issues with the radio broadcast too. It was spooky. They were there and then they weren't. So you'll have to let me know uh, what specific episodes you're having problems with because I always test them to make sure that they're, they're working links. Uh, it's it's out of my hands, folks, out of my hands. Anyway, so if you want to check out what is available in the 50-50 game sale to benefit Extra Life, you can simply go to thegaminggang.com. Uh, you can, number one, click on any article. And if you look at the right side, you will see a little 50-50 sale ad, I guess we'll say. You can do that, or even just landing on the front page. If you take a peek, you will see that there is also an image with a, a link for you to go to. And it is just a big, long list of all the goodies. And then I have images of all of them. All, I think it was, what, 25 images it took to fit everything in it. So... So Mad Men says that they had no problem with any of the shows except the two that he had mentioned. Tried them both on iPad and on laptop. All right, I will take a peek at uh, what's going on later on. Of course, we have a new episode of The Spooktacular going to air at 9 p.m. Central. So you can swing on over to thegaminggang.com. Check that out. It is Lights Out, The Flame. This is from 1943. Three, if I remember correctly. All right, let's jump on into the news because I've got a nice eclectic mix. Oh, actually, I should point out, first of all, those of you watching live, if you're waiting for the Shiver review, kick back, put your feet up, relax. If you are watching this stream 30 minutes or more after it ends, there will be timestamps. So if you want to jump past the news, you can. Those timestamps are in the show notes. And depending on the device you're watching this on, might actually even be right there in the timeline of the video. All right, all that said, let's jump on into the news because slated for a late 2022 release from Rio Grande Games is Crossing Oceans. Here's what I know. Featuring 50 historic ships, Crossing Oceans revives the golden era of ocean liners at the turn of the 20th century. Ever larger and faster steamships revolutionized maritime traffic. And, of course, they were completely unsinkable. We all know that. None of them could sink. Didn't matter how big they were, how titanic they built them, just could not sink. 
Daring Shipping Company has opened steamship lines to the major ports worldwide. Modern steel juggernauts replaced traditional sailing vessels and competed intensely for dominance on these shipping routes. Build yourself a thriving merchant fleet and guide it to economic prosperity. Acquire the most modern steamships on the market and take over the precious ports from your rivals. Build an extensive network of trading posts and coal bunkers to expand the cap <clears throat> capability of your fleet. Yes, it's English, Jeff. Just read it. Make use of diverse options to carry out lucrative transports and win the prestigious Blue Ribbon of the North Atlantic. Crossing Oceans picks up the theme and some elements of the 2017 board game Transatlantic, composing an entirely new game on a large historical map. During their turn, a player can put a ship on the board or take a contract, use contracts in three different ways, optional, and choose an action on the rondelle. The main difference in this design is that it's a rondelle game, not a card-driven game. Crossing Oceans is for two to four players, ages 14 and up, plays in around 45 to 90 minutes. It's going to carry an MSRP of $69.95, when it arrives in stores in December. I like the way the board looks, and it appears you've got two options. It looks like one is almost a historical-looking map, and then the other has a, a bit more, there we go, there's the historic-style map, and then the other side i'm taking a guess just has a bit of a more modern look to it could be very interesting so i'm i'm a, a naval fan so i kind of i kind of dig this kind of stuff <laughs> so what can i tell you all righty then doug roberts is with us in chat welcome aboard doug good to have you with us tonight let's move on to our next news piece because currently up on kickstarter is an expandable card game which is based on John Wick's 7th C role-playing game. Here's the dope on City of Five Sales, which is from Pinebox Entertainment. I believe it is licensed through Chaosium. City of Five Sales is an expandable card game set in the swashbuckling world of Chaosium's 7th C role-playing game by John Wick, as I just mentioned. Players control one of five factions as they fight to influence, control, and explore the independent and unruly city of Five Sails. Primarily designed for two players, multiplayer allows for up to four players. Each player assumes the role of a leader who, with the help of their loyal allies, spreads their influence across the city to control key locations, hire mercenaries, and exploit ancient artifacts. Savvy leaders consider Five Sales its own player in the game. It is represented with the City Deck, a pre-built deck of cards that is the city itself with unusual characters, items, and events. This deck will shift as player engagement changes the story of Five Sales. Players have to navigate the city and its goings-on just as much as they must navigate their opponent. The winds of fate and treachery are billowing in the City of Five Sails. Player decisions will steer the way. Throw your weight behind your favorite faction and captain their way to victory. The story of Seventh Sea, City of Five Sails, will be constantly shifting and evolving based upon community-driven choices, major tournaments, and participation. How the story progresses is in the hands of you, the players. There is a two-minute-long Kickstarter video that uh, we'll take a peek at. So kick back, and let's give it a watch. The history of this city goes back 600 years. She's seen her share of ravages. Battles, fires, plagues. Each conflict a cause of destruction and a cause for creation. The city's a maze of tight alleyways that twist and turn. And there's always more than one way to get where you need to go. She's a place where a dishonest man can earn an honest coin. A 
place where you can find a thing even before it's lost. And those who fall under her disfavor can find life very difficult. It's here, in the City of Five Sails, where heroic sagas are born by deeds of might and action. By intrigue and fancy words. Where anyone can seize a city if they've got enough coin. Pine Box Entertainment is proud to present a new adventure for fans of narrative-driven tabletop experiences. An evolving card game set in Thea's most interesting city. Seventh C, City of Five Sails. A game of swashbuckling, sorcery, piracy, adventure, political intrigue, and skullduggery within the city. Featuring key elements from the Seventh C role-playing game, incorporated into a rich tabletop experience with an evolving, player-driven narrative. Players will engage in combat duels that go back and forth with impending damage. Repost, parry, and thrust at your opponent with the assistance of risk cards and attachments to damage and eliminate opposing crew members and mercenaries. It's time to swashbuckle your way to power and stake your claim on the freest city in all of Thea. 7th C. City of Five Sales, live on Kickstarter, October 11th, 2022. Seventh C, City of Five Sales is for two to four players. It's designed for two. You can increase it to four players. And plays in around 20 to 80 minutes. No doubt that depends on the player count. This Kickstarter is fully funded. You can reserve a copy of the game for a $50 pledge, or you can reserve a copy of the digital edition, so just a print and play, for a $25 pledge through November 4th. Expected delivery is August of next year. Christopher Rush mentions a city deck is a neat idea. This does sound pretty cool. One thing I will point out, though, I'm not sure if anybody from Pine Box Entertainment is going to see this video or not, but I did go over to the website, and the website is not working. That does not bode well for Kickstarters. So the strange thing is, on Google, if you do a search, you actually get results for the different pages and things like that. So I'm taking a guess, maybe it's being migrated to a new server or something like that, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know about you folks out there, but a lot of times when I'm looking at a Kickstarter, I go and I check out the website. <laughs> so Batman says they saw the website wasn't working too, but points out that he has enjoyed their Savage Worlds content. Yeah, I'm not saying it. this isn't a legitimate company. I'm just saying it's not a great, great idea to have your website be down when you're in the midst of a Kickstarter. So let's move on to some role-playing game news. Now, the Seventh Sea City of uh, Five Sales is, I believe, licensed through Chaosium. But let's talk about some Chaosium Inc. news because there is a new supplement for Call of Cthulhu. It is on the very near horizon. Here's the scoop on Regency Cthulhu. Yes. Regency England, a time of social niceties, of grand balls, and of romantic intrigues and disappointments, as described most adroitly in the novels of Miss Jane Austen. But the Regency is also a time of lurid Gothic romances and of war and social upheaval as the Industrial Revolution gets into full swing and the hostilities with Napoleonic France draw to a close. Against this backdrop, the mythos insinuates itself into the very fabric of society, always watchful for the opportunity to instill fear and terror into the hearts of everyday Georgians from the richest to the poorest. Regency Cthulhu, darkness and decorum in Jane Austen's England, say that five times fast, 
is a historical source book for the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game set in the early Regency period, circa 1813. It describes the fictional town of Terryford in Wiltshire, England, as well as presenting two scenarios designed to introduce players to both the time period and the town's mysteries. Suitable for use with both classic Call of Cthulhu and Pulp Cthulhu rules, players take on the roles of budding Regency investigators, be they members of the gentry or the working classes. Together, they uncover the dark secrets at the heart of Terryford, horrors that have lain dormant for many a year, but now seek to burst forth into England's green and pleasant land. Included within are details on the Georgian time period, in particular the Regency era, from 1811 to 1820. I thought most people, even though it's not really the Regency era, I thought most historians extended out to like 1830. I don't know, just what I've run across. And yes, amazingly enough, I do know a, a bit about the Regency period. <laughs> I listen to a lot of, you know, audiobooks. What can I tell you? There's also rules for creating Regency investigators, along with new period-appropriate skills and occupations. There's a setting overview detailing the town of Terryford, its businesses and personalities in 1813 and 1913. Well, that gives us a little hint inside the two scenarios which are titled The Long Corridor and The Emptiness Within. There are investigator handouts and maps, six classic and pulp pre-generated investigators ready to pick up and play. There's also guidance on both pulp and classic style play. The supplement, obviously enough, is best used with the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, and of course, optionally, with the Pulp Cthulhu supplement, which are both available separately. Regency Cthulhu will arrive on October 27th. Zoinks in 10 days. Isn't that crazy? I mean, yes, granted, this news did come out at the end of last week. But that is a pretty fast uh, turnaround on the announcement there. It is going to carry an MSRP of $44.99. I do not have a page count. I'm going to take a stab in the dark. We're probably looking at 224 pages. That's my stab in the dark. <laughs> Christopher Rush says, yikes, too soon. <laughs> Kevin R. Smith is with us in chat. Good to see you, Kevin. Plenty Huron's with us as well. I don't believe I said hello to 245 Trioxin who I see has also popped in, as well as Boris. So we've got a nice chat off and rocking today. Kevin says, the mysterious brooding nobleman was a cultist all along. Yes. What the hell's his name in Sense and Sensibility? Mr. Darcy. That's right. Oh, my God, Mr. Darcy's actually... <laughs> He's a deep one. <laughs> so there's... This deep one in inbreeds. <laughs> Perkins Dearborn has popped on in saying that they want to run a hard boiled RPC, RPC, <laughs> RPG based in the 1920s or 30s. Yeah, I wonder where you could find something like that. Hey, you know what? Maybe even with some, oh, I don't know, like horror elements, like cosmic horror elements. That would be really cool. Speaking of Call of Cthulhu, uh, if you missed it, my 900th review for the Gaming Gang popped out last Friday, and it is of the classic set, the two-inch two -inch deluxe box set. Why can't I speak today? Very strange. I, I shot a video earlier. I don't... I could, I could speak okay then when I'm, you know, stone cold sober. So I don't know what's going on here anyway, but yes, which is right over my shoulder here. You probably can't make it out. I mean, for one, it's intentionally blurry, but 
But yes, that was my 900th review because I wanted to make it something, yeah, pretty special. Something kind of near and dear to my heart. Moving along. Well, before we move along, I should point out that Michael O'Brien has informed me that once this arrives in the warehouse, it is on its way to me. So stay tuned. We should be taking a look at this prior to its release on the 27th. Well, let's keep talking about horror because currently you can score some scarily good savings on a slew of Dungeon Crawl Classics horror adventures through Bundle of Holding. And here's the deets on the deal. Adventura. This Dungeon Crawl Classics Horror Bundle presents spooky PDF ebooks for DCC, the Goodman Games tabletop fantasy role playing game. Though many DCC modules present sword and sorcery scenarios of gold and glory, in 2015, Goodman branched out, oozed out, to produce annual horror scenarios often tied to Halloween that throws standard Dungeon Crawl Classics fantasy characters into nightmarish pocket dimensions, Cthulhu laboratories, Frankensteinian towers, abomination haunted coffin ships, and cursed wedding receptions. Slip any of these digital adventures for a character levels 0 through 6. Do, re do remember, Dungeon Crawl Classics levels are about half of regular OSR levels. So a level one character in DCC is effectively a level two. Anyway, you can slip any of these digital adventures into your regular campaign as a trick. And with the right attitude, everyone will eat them up like a treat for just $9. And why is this popping up? I'm telling you. I am telling you. I don't know why the cubicle seven thing <laughs> popped up there because I double checked all of these. That's why we don't see the, you know, usually don't see the uh, little image from the <laughs> wrong <laughs> address pop up too often. Anyway, for just $9.95, you'll get all seven titles in the Dungeon Crawl Classics Horror Collection with a retail value of $42 as DRM free ebooks including the zero-level funnel campaign kickoff, Creep, Scrag, Creep. And they served Brendelin Red, the low-level adventures Shadow Under Devil's Reef, The Corpse That Love Built, which I have reviewed, It Consumes, and the Web of All Torment, and the level six module, The Sinister Sutures of the Seamstress. The savings run through. Halloween. Do also have to point out, I don't see that anything's going to charity from this. I was very surprised. <laughs> Wait a minute, it says, Cubicle 7 image got loose there, Jeff. Yes, I know. I know. Kevin says, I know there are some OSR products that allow you to mix cosmic horror with D&D retro clones but I'm not sure if there are any generic hard-boiled gangster detective games that can do that. Uh, if we're talking OSR, probably not. I mean, if you're looking for something that, you know, that came out in that period, of course, we've got Gangbusters. There's also a newer version of gangbusters that somebody did as Christopher Rush points out gangbusters. Yes. Gumshoe. You can always use gumshoe. Don't know. That's not OSR though. So, but uh, gumshoe's a, a, a pretty decent system. I gotta be honest. I really loved, you know, it actually wasn't from Pelgrin press. Off the top of my head, I forget who released it. Bubblegum Shoe. I thought it was great. I thought that was fantastic. It's not hard-boiled detective stories, but it utilizes that gumshoe engine. So, 
Perkins says they're going to do some research. I would say, you know what? If you're not looking just for OSR mechanics, I, I would definitely say take a look at Gumshoe because that probably is going to help you simulate those, you know, like Dashiell Hammett stories and, and things like that. Worth a shot. Anyway, so this is a pretty decent deal. So you get seven PDFs, $9.95. Usually the PDFs for Dungeon Crawl Classics are $6.99. So you are scoring some pretty decent deals here. And I got to be honest, I thought the corpse that Love built was, was pretty good. It was pretty good. I, you know, horror role-playing is subjective. I talk about this all the time. I, I highly doubt anybody actually really gets scared playing a horror role-playing game. People might kind of get creeped out by stuff, but not really scared. My final news piece, there is a new source book which has arrived for the Traveler role-playing game. Here's the latest on Aliens of Charted Space, Volume 3, from Mongoose Publishing. Aliens of Charted Space, Volume 3, explores five races. The pacifist Darians, the Igno... Uh, Gini? Gini? Okay, the enigmatic Gini, the playful dolphins, the aloof orca, and the bureaucratic wops. Within these covers, you'll discover the culture and society of these races, as well as their physiology and their psychology. First, we've got the Darians, who I believe are married to Samantha on Bewitched. Oh, I'm sorry, that'd be the Darians. The Darians are known to be a pacifistic race who value excellence in scientific and artistic endeavors. Many believe the Darians an easy target or that their outlook makes them inconsequential on the galactic stage. Nothing can be further from the truth. The Darians are heirs to some of the most advanced technology available in charted space, and their advancement continues. For those who believe they can conquer this race of pacifistic scientists and artists, the Darians have a feared weapon capable of causing a star to go supernova. The star trigger. The g and &E. The genie claim to be descendants of the ancients and have the ruins and remnant technology to support this. When first contacted by the Villani, they were thought to be a major race until it was discovered they had reverse engineered their jump drive, causing the reaction of their position and relegating them to become a minor race. The genie have struggled to have their achievements recognized by the greater interstellar community ever since. Then we got the dolphins. From Miami, obviously. Dolphins were gifted Sophony by Genesis, a gene genetic engineering corporation founded on Soleimani principles. The project was a success, and the dolphins had become recognized as a minor race in their own right. Their communities are based on principles of total freedom and equality, but they owe a debt of honor to the humans who gave them reason and thought. We also have the Orca which are another race granted uh, Safansi, Safansi? Safansi, let's say, by Genesis, but this time grudgingly. The project to raise them suffered a serious setback, which nearly ended the program, if not for the generosity of the people of Sufrin. Uh, matriarchal and aloof, the Orca are far less friendly than their dolphin cousins, do not share their outlook, said holding principles of uh, matriarchal veneration and mindfulness. And then we've got the Bwops. Evolved amid the swamps of an alien world, Bwop civilization grew slowly through cooperation and the universal belief that they all had an individual and unique place in the universe to fulfill. Their obsession with minutia and fine detail placed them in the perfect position to make themselves indispensable to the bureaucracy of the Zurosika, granting them access to technology denied to others. This book contains rules for creating travelers from each of these alien races, high guard additions and new ship, and central supply catalog entries for their new equipment. 
This 296-page hardcover carries an MSRP of $59.99, while the PDF alone is available at Drive-Thru RPG for $35.99. Perkins Dearborn points out, Bruce Dern is back with his little robot friends. Yes. That was the first thing I thought of when I saw that image was silent running which I love. I think that is just an awesome movie. Although they've got more like arms on this than Huey, Dewey, and Louie had, the maintenance bots. So yes, Perkins points out that, yes, that right there on our right, but you'll notice they've got like additional appendages and that was not the case. But yeah, that, that's got to be a nod to them as well. All right. So let's see anybody sneaking into chat that I forgot to say hello to. All right. Looks like, uh, I am caught up. Cool. But yeah, I was kind of curious if anybody was going to mention silent running when that image came up. Nice. All right. That is it for the news tonight. Of course, I was just talking about drive through RPG. Don't forget the gaming gang. Thus the dispatch is affiliated with the One Bookshelf sites. So if you are going to visit, say, drive through RPG, please stop by thegaminggang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a small portion at sale. And all those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do add up and help keep thegaminggang.com around. Also, if you like this video, if you dig the channel, if you find the gaminggang.com to be a valuable resource. Hell, if you just like what we're doing, you can always swing over to paypal.me slash the gaming gang and making a small donation and a big tip of the cap to everybody out there who uses either both or one of the banners or paypal.me. So much appreciated. Thank you very much. Also, if you arrived late, into chat or if you're just tuning in now do want to mention that the 50 50 game sale to benefit extra life has kicked off and there are over 200 items up for sale so lots of goodies available some stuff's already gone not a ton but a few items are already gone and i do know coco b is laying claim to the Castles and Crusades collection. Yes, you could have gotten your hands on five Castles and Crusades books, but now you it didn't take a look soon enough. So now they're gone. Coco B scoring those as well as, oh, now at the top of my head, I can't remember. <laughs> hey, there's over 200 items, over 200 games there and role-playing game books a wee bit of miniatures as well. So there are some pretty cool goodies. There's some out of print stuff you can't get anymore. And the prices are pretty rock bottom. So want to mention that also. So we're going to get into our first look at Shiver in just a few moments. But do you want to mention, you might be sitting there thinking, hey, uh, wait a second. I thought you were going to do a review of the... Southland's Player's Guide today, Jeff. Well, I did. The video's out. <laughs> so, just wanted to, wanted to, you know, change things up. I'll point it out. I'm not, I'm not super comfortable doing reviews live. Just not. It's like I lose my train of thought. You see me lose my train of thought when I record videos because I don't script anything. Just imagine when I'm doing it live. I will do more live reviews. Don't worry. I just uh, want to take a little break. So I've got my review of the Southlands Player's Guide up already. And if you missed it, as I mentioned already, you might see it over my shoulder here. The 900th review on the GamingGang.com went live on Friday. And it is of the classic Call of Cthulhu two-inch deluxe set. 
from Chaosium Inc. Huge thumbs up. Fantastic. Christopher Rush points out they grabbed Kids on Bikes, the deluxe edition. Yes, which actually shipped out today. So I'm trying to uh, turn around on these as quickly as possible without actually being like a retail establishment. So this about 92 is with us in chat saying, woo, no doubt over the 50, 50 sale. Also did a review of Axion library. So you might want to check that out. And the horned rat companion. So I did a, my review of that as well. So you will still find a new review at thegaminggang.com every single day this month. So just thought I'd change things up. Tomorrow, we're going to be taking a first look at Crown of the Cobalt King for Pathfinder from Paizo Inc. Then on Wednesday, I'm going to unbox and take a first look at the Fallout role-playing game starter set. So kind of changed things up a little bit. I was going to do reviews of Grand Mechanismo as well as the referee's guide for Hyperborea. I will still share those reviews this week. They'll just be standalone videos. So uh, mainly because uh, personally, I think it's a little more time sensitive to take a peek at Crown of the Cobalt King and the Fallout starter set. I know a lot of people are interested in that starter set. So, yes, yes. Who just popped in? Somebody popped in. Ah, there we go. It's Testy Trekkie. Howdy, Testy Trekkie. Good to see you. Okay. So anyway, so that's uh, that's what's cooking. Lots going on. So we got the sale. We've got the October Spooktacular that's still carrying on. So every night at 9 p.m. Central, you got spooky old-time radio shows for you to check out. And every day throughout the month, a brand new review over at thegaminggang.com. And all the live shows in October feature role-playing games. So kind of cool. A lot going on. A lot going on. Tessie Trekkie says they just got Oz by Andrew Kolb, and it's great. Didn't they also, they did Neverland. Isn't that, isn't that the author who did Nef Neverland too? Which I, I heard good things about that as well. Speaking of good things, I did listen to the audiobook. It's John Peterson who wrote Playing at the World. Is it Mage Wizard something like, off the top of my head, I don't recall. But it was the uh, the history, essentially, of early years of D and D, and I thought it was pretty good. I listened to the audiobook. I thought it was a pretty even presentation. It kind of made both Gygax and Arneson out to be kind of dickheads each. But <laughs> so. Uh, William asks, what about my original uh, review that I was planning for 900? The uh, Temple of Elemental Evil original adventure reincarnated. You know what? I need to take a peek because I'm trying to remember if I did, because that's volume six. For some strange reason, I don't think I did my review of volume five. So, wasn't the, isn't volume five The Lost City? Could have sworn. I could have swore I did a video review of that. I don't know. Don't know. Well, you know, when you got all these reviews and it's not just reviews, it's also stuff that, you know, you're taking a peek at first looks, all that other stuff too. So, uh, two, four, five tracks and points out that kids on bikes. Second edition is live on Kickstarter. Yes. That's actually a news piece tomorrow. <laughs> that is, uh, yeah, I got the email from renegade game studios. I think it was this afternoon. And uh, I was like, oh, well, I already got my news pieces together. So there is that. All right. We're going to be jumping in to take a look at Shiver in just a couple of moments. But first, I think it's time for a brief intermission. 
It's intermission time, folks. Time out for a delicious snack in our sparkling refreshment building. Every item a fresh, appetizing taste treat. This machine will make you want a cup of Wilkins coffee. Not me. I'll take mine with cream and sugar. The best candy on earth comes from Bar Milky Way. Hey, little, little, there's milk in its middle. Milk in its chocolate, too. There's so much milk in the Milky Way, you can almost hear it. Mm. Wholesome and good, that's Milky Way. And the reason is right in the name, milk. Each year, millions of gallons of fresh milk, the kind you drink, go into Milky Way candy bars. There's milk in the creamy Yuki and in the pure milk chocolate. Mighty Milky, mighty good, Milky Way. There's so much milk in the Milky Way, you can almost hear it. The best candy on earth comes from Bob. Wonkins lives! And major bonus points to Perkins Dearborn for recognizing Buster Keaton in that Milky Way commercial. I know there's probably folks out there watching this thinking, who the hell's Buster Keaton? One of the greatest, if not, in some opinions, the greatest uh, silent film comedian of all time. I, I actually lean Chaplin. It's just me. And yes, amazingly enough, I am one of those weird people who has watched a lot of silent films. <laughs> Mostly comedies, but a lot. So <laughs> Perkins goes, who? Yeah, Perkins was just <laughs> typing out Buster out of nowhere. Like, I don't know. Sarah D's with us, also pointing out... Uh, that uh, Wonkins lives, but probably needs to change his pants now. I have mine with cream and sugar. Oh, anyway, one other thing I'm going to mention, but I'm not uh, going to get into it right now. I'm going to talk a little bit about Gary Khan, but I will do that after. We take our first look at the Shiver role-playing game from Parable Games. It is written by Charlie Menzies and... Barney Menzies, with artwork provided by Ben Alexander. The 224-page hardcover carries an MSRP of $49.99. Although, strangely enough, I want to say on the website it says $54.99. You can grab the PDF over at DriveThruRPG normally for $22.44. It's exchange rate, no doubt, but it is actually part of the Halloween sale, which has kicked off over at Drive Through RPG. So right now you can get it for seventeen ninety five. There is also a Kickstarter that is going on currently for a couple of starter sets for Shiver. So I will mention that as well. We kind of take a peek on in. Kevin points out they know who Buster Keaton is, but obviously not well enough to recognize him. Not well enough to recognize him at that age either. I just happen to recognize him uh, from a few different things. He was in a an episode of Twilight Zone at that point, which was silent. 
And he was also, uh, he would he would show up in like TV shows. Like, I think he I think he showed up on the Lucy Show, and he was in a one of Charlie Chaplin's last films. So, Perkins says, you know, Jeff and I are old dudes by what we instantly recognize. Speaking of my age, next Monday is my birthday. Probably not going to have a show. So, because not only is it my birthday, it's also my sister-in-law's birthday. And it's the day before my mom's birthday. So, all right. Anyway, enough about birthdays. Let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got the Shiver role-playing game. So, a few things to mention. First off, the fine folks over at Parallel Parable Games. I almost said parallel. Parable Games for kind enough to provide me with this review copy. They also sent along a set of shiver dice, which we will take a look at. Also want to point out that the uh, folks over at Parable Games sent this along, but neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the game gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share this coverage with you. That's important that you know that these days. Also, I'll be picture in picture up here as always. So that means as we take a peek through, going to be cutting off a little bit of the upper left of the book. We're not going to look at each and every page, but I do want to give you a good feel for what's in here. And we'll explore this together because I have not cracked this open. I haven't even read what's on the back of this book, which I will do right now and hopefully not completely butcher it. Or, but then again, it is a horror game. Maybe butchering it would be a good thing. Will you survive your story? I would hope so. It's my story. Experience tantalizing tales of terror, mystery, and suspense as you play out your very own horror movie with your friends. See if you can survive the night in this wickedly fun tabletop role-playing game. Easy and quick to learn rules, which you can pick up and play straight away. Everything you need in one book to both play and host the game. A symbolic dice system that avoids numbers. Yes, because math is hard. Put stories first and provides a variety of ways for your tales to evolve. Investigate and explore strange worlds and stories pulling from popular culture and folklore. Flee iconic slashers, battle aliens, exercise ghosts, and face any horrors you can imagine. Play stories set anytime, anywhere, and as anyone. From medieval peasants fighting zombies to 1980s kids on bikes, the choice is yours. Do believe this won some awards as well uh, in the UK. So going to jump on in. So everybody's talking about their ages. So I, you know, here, okay. So here's the funny thing. I've had somebody commenting lately about how their kids enjoy watching my videos. And I do know that my best friend, Elliot's daughter, uh, Allie, tends to watch the show from time to time. I don't know how often, but he's, he's told me she watches his videos and that. I honestly did not think that uh, I would be very appealing to younger people to watch. <laughs> now, strangely enough, the person who says their kids watch, I don't know if they're trying to be insulting <laughs> or not because they they just left a comment today about using puppets and i know i have had people bitch at me because they're like yeah it's like listening to somebody talk to a little child i was like no that's not it all right so let's see what we got here a forward on fear fear is a funny old thing when i say old i mean really old since the dawn of time it makes the heart race the brow sweat and the mind run away with itself, imagining what horrors may lie in wait, lurking and unknown. A primal feeling that runs through every human, desperately trying to keep us alive, causing us to flee, hide, or even fight for our survival. 
So why now in our calmer age of existence do we seek it out? Why do we gather around campfires and tell scary stories, huddle together in the dark to watch horror films, and send popcorn flying in fright? I've never done that. Explore the abandoned houses as there's rumors they're haunted. My answer to you is this. Fear is fun. Christopher says, it's your energy and positive attitude. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know how much energy I have. <laughs> Batman says, I'm young-minded and young at heart. Well, that is true. Because, you know, all of us who are into this kind of stuff have got to be. You have to be. Uh, and thankfully, the world has not beaten our imaginations out of us. <laughs> so... James Eck is with us. Simeon's joined us in chat as well. Welcome, welcome. All right, so let's jump on in here. It's it's kind of interesting. I almost have the impression, I could be absolutely wrong here, but the way they, they bolded anytime, anywhere, anyone, I wonder if this game uses uh, some sort of a system with keywords. I, for some strange reason, that's what popped in my head when I was taking a look at this. So... Uh, our first chapter is going to give us a breakdown on how to play. Story is king. So there is no winning or losing in Shiver. Only the story and how that goes is up to you. You may weave a thrilling, scary story with your friends. Sometimes you may all survive and defeat the evil that has been plaguing the town. Other times you may all be killed. And then the story resolves in a much grimmer fashion. So I did mention there's a Kickstarter that's currently going on. And it is for a couple of starter sets for Shiver. And one is uh, Shiver Slasher. I think it's pretty obvious what films that's tackling. And the other is actually Shiver Blockbuster, which I guess kind of moves away from the horror aspect and more into the... Uh, you know, pulse pounding action summer blockbuster. So the director describes the environment. Players describe how they wish to proceed. Director narrates the result of the player's actions. So we're going to get uh, a breakdown of these dice. So we've got six different sides to the six sided dice. And these are, I believe, our skill dice, is what it's saying here. So we have grit, which is the fist, wit, which is the key, smarts, which is the light bulb with the brain. Christopher says they need a shiver me timbers. Funny enough, the blockbuster adventure looks like it's uh, like a pirate adventure. Looks like there's pirates and a big like hammerhead shark. Kathy Evans points out that uh, the youngsters might like the show because they intermissions. <laughs> they bet on whether uh, Wonkins will live or die. I think that's what it is. And once they see that, they tune out. So that's smart. Heart, which is the heart symbol. Actually, it was kind of funny. When I saw the die, I thought this was a rose. We also have luck, which is four-leaf clover. And then we have strange, which is the purple eye. Shiver uses two dice types, both with different symbols on each of their faces. The skill die, which is what we just looked at. And the talent die, which is the eight-sided dice. I am not sure what we've got. Looks like we've got those strange symbols and stars on them. When characters want to take an action, the director may ask them to make a skill check, the result of which will determine how successful the character is at the action that they wish to take. Each skill check has a core skill associated with it, which will determine what dice they must roll for their character. An example. Character's path is blocked by a heavy object and they want to lift it out of the way. 
Director must decide which core skill would be used for this. Smarts, obviously. I'd be a terrible game master, right? So uh, in this example, physical strength is required. So the director would select grit as the core skill for the skill check. So we have different challenge ratings, one to five. Easy, medium, hard, very hard, and nigh impossible. I know it says near impossible. So we take the challenge rating based on the weight. Okay, so here they're saying it's a challenge rating of two, which is medium. Enemy and enemies and characters are also all assigned a challenge rating, which determines how hard they are to attack or be targeted. All player characters start at a CR one. So you're going to have a dice pool. So we're looking at core skill points. So depending on the, the skill level, that's the number of dice you're going to get to roll. I'm taking a wild stab that whatever the skill is, that you're utilizing, you must get one of those faces on your dice to succeed. So we also have talent points. So it says how many talent points do you have in the chosen core skill and add that number of talent dice to your dice pool. Special abilities, we have advantage and disadvantage and a luck bank and fear status. So it talks about failing in Shiver. Failure has consequences. Well, that's true in all role-playing games. So it says, after these steps, you're ready to roll your dice pool. So after you've totaled up all your different dice. To succeed in a skill check, the player must roll a number of core skill symbols of the specified type greater than, okay, here we go, greater there than or equal to the challenge rating of the skill check. Wow. So, okay, so I guess the, the star is, a, is the talent on the talent dice. I wonder if those count as the face that you need because that would be if you had a hard challenge and your skill is like a three i mean wouldn't that be pretty tough combine skill checks opposed skill checks assisting skill checks dice conversion yes if you don't want to purchase these dice you can use obviously six and eight ciders I believe there's also an app that is available as well. So we've got uh, wounds, armor, some modes of play. We have survivor mode, nightmare mode. Here's our character sheet. So here, as an example, we've got core skill, like grit five and talent one. I'm taking guess, do we get uh, a number of points to break down? That would be my guess. Ooh, we got a doom clock. There we go. We've got a doom clock. So there's uh, some discussion about theaters and how theaters are going out of business, how they're closing. Because so many people are streaming. Well, it's what's led to the streaming wars. So we have the doom clock. So when a player rolls their dice pool, there's always a chance of failure. And in Shiver, failure can have dark consequences. Anytime your character is engaging in moving the story forward, they have a chance to improve the situation for them and their allies. However, things won't always go to plan. And your failed actions might make things worse. 
This is what the doom clock represents. So we have quarter past, half past, quarter two, and then midnight. So here, as an example, at midnight, the slasher appears and is a permanent threat, stalking the players through the halls. Story continues, but with an ever-looming presence. Okay. So we've got advantage and luck. So a minor advantage gives the character an extra, extra skill die. And a major advantage will give a player an extra talent die. And we also have disadvantage as well. So we've got combat. Move, attack, interact. It's bringing that down. So you can move, interact, attack. Assemble your dice pool, roll your dice, and apply your results. So, all in all, we've got three pages, well, three and a half pages of combat rules. So, this appears to be very much a storytelling game, not a crunchy game whatsoever. Kevin is talking about uh, Neil Gaiman quoting Douglas Adams as saying, books are sharks. Nothing is as good as being a book as a book. Because, yes, books have survived. Books have, books have, uh, there, there is no, no chance that they're going to disappear anytime soon. Of course, you know, we're talking mainly ebooks. Most, most people read now, but. Uh, personally, I still like to have, you know, physical book in my hand. So we've got building the character. So you're going to choose an archetype. You're going to choose a background and you're going to choose a fear. So we got the archetypes, the warrior, the maverick, the scholar, the socialite, the fool. Hey, it's shaggy. The weird, the survivor. So we have archetype trees and character levels. Maximum character level a character can reach in Shiver is 15. So we got a checklist to run us through all that. It's like we're going to get a breakdown of the various different characters. So what I'm kind of curious about is this game is presented as if it's like a film. So I would think that this would be geared towards kind of single shot tales, not necessarily uh, a lot of campaign gaming. So I'm kind of, kind of surprised that we have like these different tiers for, I would take a guess for various different levels. So we have a, a, a tree here. That's kind of cool. So at tier one, you're tough. Tier two, you get some choices. And then you've got the berserker, the fighter, the protector. So I, I kind of like how they, they do this. Although once you make your choice down here at tier two, I mean, you're, that's it. That's what you're going to be. So we got the maverick. The Scholar. I mentioned this when we were taking a look at the news piece for Shiver Gothic, which is now out in PDF. This art kind of has a, a, a little bit of a Mike Mignola vibe to it. The artist uh, of Hellboy. So there is the Socialites. The Fool. We don't know why you'd pick this. Displaying very few discerning skills as well as an array of bad habits. There's very little fools have to contribute. But whatever higher power there is is looking down upon them. Sees them favorably. Luck is forever on their side. The, the character you see in a terrible situation and think, how on earth are they still alive? 
The answer is we don't know either. <laughs> it's the stoner. So we got uh, a little bit of discussion in uh, about books. <laughs> so here's the fool tree. <laughs> so tier one is banking on it. What is that? Let's take a look real quick. You forgo using your luckiness and bide your time gathering up all that positive probability. You can now bank up to three luck points at a time in your luck bank. So that is their tier one ability. Now look, it's the fool fighting some, some deep ones. So we've got the weird. You know that kid at school who said they could see ghosts and your parents told you to avoid? But yeah, I guess that's the weird. See, to me, this seems like this is more designed for campaign play. And I've got absolutely no issue with that. I'm just saying it it's even on, I wasn't it like on the back of the book, how it discusses that, you know, you're playing a movie. Then we get some backgrounds. So we've got uh, like the warrior has the jock, the soldier, the gentle giant, the goon. Oh, one of my favorite comics too. It's the goon. If you've never read the goon, you are missing out. Eric Powell. Uh, and then we got the troglodyte. Maverick backgrounds, the hunter, the criminal, the rebel, the operative, the drifter. The scientist, the surgeon, the nerd. That's a little plague mask there for the surgeon, for that scholar background. James Eck points out these character classes remind them of Monster of the Week. I've never checked out Monster of the Week. I know my best friend Elliot Miller picked up the PDF. So I think he was looking to, because his wife is this massive, well, was a massive fan of Supernatural, which, of course, I'm sure she's excited that that, isn't it a prequel series or whatever is coming out? So I know he was uh, looking into maybe running kind of a supernatural-esque role-playing game, although I, I thought they had a supernatural one. So I remember he was talking about Monster of the Week. So we have fear. So this is where you're going to choose your fear. And then there are uh, mechanics, role-playing mechanics, of course. So Coco B says, so sad the goon movie was never made. Knife to the eye. I know. Um, yeah, they did a Kickstarter and everything. So, you know, I don't think it's completely dead. But, uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't think it's got much of a pulse. Uh, so Sarah mentions it's called the Winchesters and it just started. And she said that she's avoided it because the entire concept is contrary to the lore of the original. And she's afraid it'll ruin things for her. All right. So the madman's pointing out that his next uh, Savage World session is November 4th and it's his annual Halloween session, even though it's after Halloween. What are you like a TV show? You remember how you'd always have those TV shows to be airing the Halloween episode. And it's like, uh, you know, it's November 3rd. But he's basing it on the Headless Horseman. I have to admit, the, the Disney cartoon that they did was, was pretty decent. I thought it was, I, I liked it. Especially since they didn't change the end of the story. Ichabod Crane still disappears and you're not sure if he was killed by the horseman or if he just left. Although I think they sort of imply that he's run off. All right. So we're going to get into, looks like this is a uh, game master facing here. Take a look. 
Yep, here we go. The director. So our, our game master is called the director. And it looks like that's going to be the rest of the book here, or most of the rest of the book. So we've got setting the scene, grave introduction, mapping your story. So yes, this is more aimed at storytelling. Uh, it looks like things play out in acts and scenes. This looks pretty interesting. Reading the knuckle bones. Shiver's symbolic dice don't always offer a binary success or fail scenario, and this can play to your benefit in deciphering the outcome of skill checks during the game. Granting players surprise successes or failures with a twist can add real fun and flavor. When players roll the dice, whether they succeed or fail, a good director should be aiming to use the roll to move the story forward, no matter the result. That goes for any role-playing game. Every role has consequences that drive the narrative on. Personally, I'm one of these sorts of people, uh, when I'm running a game, I'm only having my players roll dice uh, to actually drive action. I am not one of these game masters who sits there and just says, ah, oh, well, you know, gang has a rolled dice in a while. Let's have you start rolling some dice. <laughs> so William asked if I caught the interview with Michael Moorcock. Uh, yes, it is actually over at the Goodman Games website. I have not read it. I have not checked it out. I like, well, I shouldn't say I like I love the original Elric series of books. Gotta be honest, the the later novels in that. Uh, I'm one of these people where I find it difficult to return to a character after you know they're dead in a series. So I talked about this back when Solo was coming out. And I, before it came out, I said, you know what? I don't think it's going to do all that well because they've killed Han Solo off. Which, that's why I'm kind of a little surprised that Andor has done so well on Disney. Although I haven't watched it yet. I haven't been watching really anything on Disney in a few months. I got a lot to catch up on. <laughs> but, um, like I, I had told some of my friends, I said, you know, I don't... I don't think it's going to do so well because people all, they know what happens to Han Solo. They're like, okay, well, now we know he gets killed. He's dead, which I know is silly. All characters at some point are going to die, just not necessarily, you know, on screen or on the page. But yeah, I was, I was sort of like, eh, I don't know. All right, just kind of taking a peek through here or taking a look at some gear. Oh, the bionic arm. There we go. The stake, the sledgehammer, a laser sword. So, yeah, they're uh, kind of all over as far as, you know, we could, we could pretty much set these adventures anywhere. This is why I hand her. Why do they just call it a bastard sword? Or a hand and a half. The leecher. <laughs> a strange organic contraption that seems to suck the energy and life from a target. It does the job, but at what cost? So it is a weird object. Perkins says, a funny thing happened on the way to Thor's hammer. Perkins points out that uh, the presentation for this is pretty cool. Uh, very easy to read. Yes, certainly is. Oh, look, you can have Excalibur and the Necronomicon. Different armor. So this is essentially, we're just looking at some gear throughout. Let's see what else we've got. Still more gear. Creating enemies. Who, what, where, why? Villains, monsters, creature of the night, creatures, I should say, of the night, 
are all characters in the stories you tell through Shiver. The more compelling they are as characters, the more drawn in your players will be. Frankenstein's monster isn't just a mindless beast. He is a nuanced and fascinating character, especially if you're looking at uh, him in Mary Shelley's book. So, the best antagonists are ones we can see the darker shades of ourselves in, as we should be compelled by our villains as our heroes. Halloween ends? What? What do you mean it's over? About damn time. So we have reactions. So we've got different reactions based on our skill dice. Huh, okay. So kind of giving us an idea of various types of NPCs. Then we have Dracula. Special abilities, resistances. Okay, now we get some of our NPCs, some of our creatures and big bads. There we go, cultists. Cosmic horrors. The Fishmen. Hmm. What could they be? Then we have Dagon. Dagon Spawn. Fishmen Hybrids. We've got Eldritch Entities. The Shugoth. The Night Gaunt. So we're getting some Lovecraftian stuff in here. Aliens. Animals. Oh, look, it's Cujo. So we've got infections, vampirism, lycanthropy. This looks like some other gear. Yeah, but, oh, maybe v these are supposed to be vehicles. Yeah, okay. And is this an, this looks like this is an, an adventure. Yes, it is a short shipper one shot that places players in the corporate hellhole of the Hollow. Mega Corporation Cornwell Consolidated's underground research facility. Escape from the lowest levels and make your way to the surface to survive. All right. So it says that the adventure should play out in about two to four hours. It's for two to six players. Subgenre zombie, body horror, and comedy. There you go. So, of course, this is not going to be a role-playing game for, you know, the kiddies, right? All right, so taking a peek through. It looks like we got a, a map of the facility. And a glossary of terms, status effects, and an index. And that is... Shiver from Parable Games. So, of course, I will have a review of this in the very near future. Let's crack this open. Just take a quick peek at the dice. So this comes with, looks like we've got 10 of the six-siders. And four of the eight sider. So we've got the skill and the talent. So we've got on the talent die, we've got two sides that have stars, two sides that have two stars. Well, I'll take that back. Three sides have a star, two sides have two stars, and we've got two weird symbols and two weird symbols. So that is the talent dice. And then on these we've got, so that is was the grit. That's the weird. That is the luck. Uh, 
I know that was like for wits. I don't recall what that was. Oh no, I'm sorry. This was wits with the light bulb with the brain. And then we had the die. And where's our last side? There we go. And the heart. Which as I mentioned, when I first saw that die in the package, I thought it was a rose. <laughs> <laughs> Perkins says uh, it might be trying to do too much I would need to run a full night with three to four players before really getting a solid feel for shivers yeah I would I would think that but it, it certainly doesn't look as if it is very complex from what it looked like it like I said it uh, it is certainly more of a storytelling game not not a lot of crunch to the rules, but it also looks like it it might draw some inspiration from powered by the apocalypse games as well, where you you tend to have success but failure but success and failure and sort of thing possibly going on. But of course, I can't say for sure before I you know start digging into this and reading it from cover to cover. But anyway, as I mentioned, I will have a review of Shiver in the very near future. Let's swing on over to the other camera. All right, come on, you. There we go. Like I said, I, I just really dislike this new update to the OBS Studio software. Everything, everything's like enlarged. So it's difficult to get to like the little scenes I've got set up in that. You just easily scroll down, click, scroll down, click. Now it, it, half the time it won't scroll. It's like, I yada. All righty then. So don't forget the 50 50 game sale to benefit. Extra Life has kicked off. It is going to run through November 2nd. And there are over, there's still over 200 items for sale. And 50% of the proceeds minus, well, I should say, I guess, after the PayPal uh, fees will be donated to Extra Life. And I am kicking around doing a solo stream on the Extra Life game day, which is Saturday, November 5th. So stay tuned to find out about that. All righty then. Tomorrow, I will be taking a first look at Crown of the Cobalt King for second edition Pathfinder from the fine folks over at Paizo Inc. And then on Wednesday's show, we are going to crack open the Fallout role-playing game starter set from Modifius Entertainment. So the role-playing coverage rocks on. One last thing I do want to mention, I made some tweaks to the audio because the way I had it set up, it was supposed to be taking some of like the rumble out, some of the like really like lower frequencies. And I thought I was doing it. I was like, wow, this just still sounds really kind of muddy, I guess would be a term I would use. So I tweak some stuff and it's like, oh, I guess now it's going to work. <laughs> so hopefully it's not as uh real, like low bass, not a lot of that kind of sound going on. <laughs> Okie doke. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when the Dispatch streams live Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Central right here on YouTube. It'll also let you know when I upload other videos, such as my review of the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, The Horned Rat Companion from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, 
Be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for our latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. If you're watching live, thank you very much. Always appreciate that. If you took part in chat, all those are bonus experience points for you then. Well done. But of course, I know a lot of people out there, you don't have an opportunity to watch live. It doesn't matter if you're watching live or on Memorex. Really do appreciate you taking time out of your busy life to watch any of the videos here on the Gaming Gang channel. All right, of course, I'll be back tomorrow. And here's hoping each and every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, that's okay. You don't have to leave just yet. In fact, why don't you subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel right here or take a peek at the latest live stream or even find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks again for watching.